Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Movies You Can Learn From. And today we're going to talk about the movie called Golda. It's easy to remember. It refers to Golda Meir, the first woman president, prime minister of Israel. And um, she was really something. And uh, George Case is going to help me do this. He's looked at the movie. It's a very engaging movie, and he's going to tell us what he liked about it and maybe what he didn't like about it, George. Yeah. I generally like this movie. It, it, it's encapsulated a period in the history of Israel that was traumatic because Syria and Egypt ha- attacked Israel, and Israel's intelligence was down, and they didn't know until like a, less than a day before that this attack was coming. So here was Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel, in this horrible situation, and she neg- she neg- navigated it, 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 it beautifully, a great, great navigator, you know? And there were times when Israel was almost going to be obliterated because these guys were winning, you know, the Syria and Egypt. But she held on. She's a tremendous personality, you know? I mean, I'm going to get into later what I, what I felt Helen Mirren missed, but Helen Mirren is an excellent actress, and she did all the nuts and bolts real good, right? But she missed Golda's charisma, because at the end of this movie, they showed a, sh- a short clip of Golda and um, Sadat, Anwar Sadat, af- as they were getting ready to, to, to have peace. And you could see Golda's charisma just came right through. In that short clip, Helen Mirren didn't quite capture that. With all her her makeup and all her skills, she missed that. Now, what this movie, I'll I'll, I'll try to keep this short. This movie gets into all the back and forth when Israel was losing, when Israel was winning a little bit. And at the end, Henry Kissinger, played by Liev Schreiber, who's um, an American um, actor, he's playing Henry Kissinger, how they sat down and... and, um, Really interesting. She served him borscht. She, you know, women have a way that men don't have. And one of the things I always knew about um, about Golda Meir, because as a woman, she's more sensitive. She's sensitive to her staff. She's sensitive to Moshe Dayan, who was uh, totally devastated because she screwed up royally, right? So she knew, you know, women have a way that she she was as she was the not only the first woman prime minister. She was the only prime minister, woman leader of Israel. And she came through with flying colors. So I'll, leave, I'll get, let you get into some more, Jay, and then maybe I can chime in. Things will come to mind. Hmm. Well, I watched the movie twice mm-hmm. because I thought that it captured historic events yeah, yeah. in 1973. And it captured the, you know, the soul of the Israeli government of the relationship between the, the prime minister, Golda, uh, especially as a woman, and her management team and generals. And, um, you know, we've been all studying the Israel um, defense against Gaza terrorism. And we, we, we have spokesmen that come around from the IDF and give us, uh, you know, reports on how things are going. Um, But this kind of fills a gap because when you put them all together, all the generals and all the leaders of the government together, uh, as we saw in this movie, then you begin to understand, number one, how they collaborated on military strategical decisions I'm sure the collaboration that existed in 73 uh, is the same kind of collaboration that existed today. And P.S., the mistakes that existed in 73 are similar to the mistakes that were made uh, before um, October 7th. Now, furthermore, um, it's not just a matter of collaborating on strategy. Uh, This movie shows you how the Israelis did that in 1973 their war room, so to speak, with uh, all the computers and uh, messages uh, and and audio from the battlefield. That was really interesting. And I say to myself, if they could do that 
in 73. You can imagine how real time it is uh, in 2023, how many years later. Um, <clears throat> notice that, is that, did I get that right? Is that 60 years later? 73 to. Uh, 83, 93, 20. Yeah, 60 years, I think. Yeah, 60. 60 years later. You can imagine what their war room is like today. With a live, live feed, live feed from the battlefield with the voices of the commanders and the troops from the battlefield feeding into a room where the combat information center uh, in Tel Aviv, where they were you know, studying on a map who was where and what was happening. I'm sure that's what happens today. We haven't seen the inside of that today in the news and in the YouTube videos that are available uh, from the IDF, <clears throat> but I'm sure um, it's like that or way better. So the, <clears throat> this movie teaches you a lot, and you have to wonder. It was I, was I was looking, it was released in 2023, it might have been released even after October 7th. I don't know. I can't tell. Um, and that's really interesting because that puts a political bent on it. Uh, here's a movie about Israel being attacked and is Israel responding and Israel having troubles responding. And we're going through the same process right now. Um, and, you know, I'm, it's a fair chance that the movie was, uh, it wasn't made before October 7th, but it might have been released um, on or after October 7th, and it, it's a statement. It's a statement about how Israel works under this kind of duress. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it because it, it filled a, a gap for me about exactly, you know, how this kind of thing works in Israel. The one thing <clears throat> that's common, which maybe we don't fully understand, is that in 73, Israel was at great risk. Um, the Egyptians were planning to march right into Tel Aviv, and the uh, Syrians were trying to blow, blow up and destroy uh, the Israeli army and, for that matter, Israel. Um, and, and so uh, Israel was at great risk, and Golda said so much, said as much to Henry Kissinger. You know, we, we need to, you know, conduct this war or we will be gone. It will be the end of Israel. And, it, you know, it, for a while, it looked like they were on the wrong end of that. <clears throat> and so if you look at what's going on right now, um, you, have to, you have to see this as a multi-front war, a war that is at least as deadly um, for all these four fronts or more. Um, there are all these countries that would like to destroy Israel. And, um, you, you know, there's a parallel there, although it's, it's not articulated in the media. This is uh, not as much as I would like to see anyway. This is a war for Israel's survival, just as the war, the Yom Kippur War, was uh, a war for survival. Yes. I say Yom Kippur because remember that the Yom Kippur War was uh, executed by uh, Egypt and Syria, and for that matter, Russia, yeah. um, you know, in uh, on Yom Kippur, on the very holiest day of the year, for the for the Jewish people, and uh, the, the same thing here, uh, in, you know, in October seventh, that was uh, that was on the Sabbath. Um, it was on uh, uh, Simchas Torah, which is a holiday, and uh, so uh, there's a, there's a parallel. It's like, you know, they they played the same playbook again, but maybe worse. Um, a lot of Israeli soldiers, the war tell, the movie tells you, were killed in the 73 war and taken uh, prisoner. And uh, in the end, there was a, an exchange negotiated um, through uh, Golda and uh, uh, what's his name in, in, in uh, Egypt? Anwar Sadat. Uh, Sadat. Yeah, yeah. And, and Henry Kissinger. So it was a negotiated uh, result, but only after... Israel turned the tides, and they used some very clever uh, ground strategies to actually turn a losing position into a winning position. And they had encircled uh, a, a, an army, an Egyptian army of thirty thousand troops, and were going and who had no water, and and they were going to destroy this army, and and they held that as a bargaining chip for Henry Kissinger to go to Nixon. And um, and arrange uh, some kind of negotiation with uh, Anwar Sadat, 
and um, I guess Syria was involved in it too. And and that and that's and that returned all the prisoners. Uh, Israel had a lot of prisoners too, by the way. And the the ratio was uh, I don't remember how many prisoners there were um, on the Israeli side, but it wasn't nearly the number of prisoners that the Israelis held from the uh, Arab side. Anyway, uh, this was instructive as a historical matter on what happened then and how it relates to what happened now. The other thing uh, I want to mention is that I never saw Helen Mirren uh, do so well. Um, now, you can say that she didn't have the charisma that perhaps uh, Golda actually had, but I think Golda was, uh, was a grandmotherly type. That's why people loved her. And she did have a sense of humor. She was kind. She, you know, she served borscht and chicken soup like any grandmother, Jewish grandmother would do. And she was from Milwaukee. I don't know if you know. She was from Milwaukee. She was born in Eastern Europe. And she spoke of that. But uh, then she came to the U.S. and and uh, and traveled and moved from Milwaukee to Israel, where she became, believe it or not, the prime minister. She also uh, lived in Colorado for a while. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this, you know, she was an American person, yeah. and she understood, and she knew Henry Kissinger, um, right. which right. which helped which helped her speak plainly to him, and negotiate. And I I really liked the the the, uh, the script on this. It was really well written, um, yeah. because she was telling him, she was she was the power player between the two of them, uh, and Lee Schreiber did a great job, although he's too tall. To represent Henry Kissinger, who was a shorter man, uh, but she, she really uh, had him going. She told him what to do. She didn't mince any words with him. And so uh, you can say that she, she on the other side of her, which maybe we didn't see enough, um, where she was, uh, you know, charismatic. But the side that counted is when she brought him into her apartment there in Tel Aviv and fed him borscht, and and uh, told him what for. She told him what for, and so, and you and you say to yourself, "Gee, uh, I wonder, you know, how that would work uh, with Tony Blinken being there, uh, or for that matter, Joe Biden um, against uh, Golda. Golda would have told him, "Hey, don't fool around with me. We'll conduct this war we want, and if you want to make any deals for a truce or a peace, a ceasefire, they'll be on our terms, and don't bother me." And <laughs> she was. The, the script was fabulous, and I think it was probably faithful. The people who put this together knew what they were doing. So, you know, the historic aspect is what appealed to me, and she played the... My wife said to me, who exactly is portraying Golda? Because it looks like Golda. It sounds like Golda. You know, all the personal characteristics of Golda. I said, it's Helen Mirren. She said, no, it's not Helen Mirren. She doesn't look anything like Helen Mirren. <laughs> so the yeah, special effects it was that th that special effects was great because you actually felt that that was Golda Meir you know I mean it, she played it really good I mean I didn't have a problem with all the nuts and bolts of playing Golda Meir it was just there's that little spark that I didn't find there you know that that I that you see at the end when they actually show a short clip as I said with uh, Anwar Sadat then you could it comes through it's within that 20, 20 second clip, it comes through. It's so, true, but my, my my answer to you is that she had two sides to her. Yeah. She had that tough side with Henry Kissinger, which was, you know, I, I love you, I accept you, but you're going to have to listen to me. Um, and the side where, where we saw her in, in the clips later, where she had this, this sense of humor and a public engagement with uh, Anwar Sadat. Um, by the way, Anwar Sadat was later assassinated. Am yes, I right? Yes. He was assassinated because he recognized Israel. Exactly. She, she got him into that. She made him recognize Israel to save his army. Um, but bottom line is, a lot of people in the Arab world didn't like that at all, and exactly. and I, I think they're the ones responsible for assassinating him. To me, Anwar Sadat is a hero because Islamic, he recognized Israel. It was Islamic Jihad. Uh, that, that assassinated him in Egypt, the, the branch of Islamic Jihad in Egypt that assassinated him, because they don't, they want to get, I mean, they don't want Israel to be there, period. Not on, nothing. They, they want to just, you know, the whole thing about the river to the sea, get, you know, that's their, you know, these half, the half uh, things that, you know, two-state solution will 
the Arab, the Palestinians ever be satisfied? That's my question. With a two-state solution, if they ha if if they get part part of the package, well, I, she no. she was the one. She had a lot of quotable quotes. We haven't talked about that. Yeah. And if you go on the internet, you will find these really memorable Yogi Berra type quotable quotes from her. And one of them was, uh, you know, when you can't negotiate a peace with someone who is sworn to kill you. Precisely. That's true. As simple as that. That's what it was. And if you brought her back, she died in 1978. If you brought her back today, she would say that again. Exactly. And she would say, Don't you, haven't you learned you can't negotiate a peace with someone who's sworn to kill you? Uh, One of the scenes that I really liked between her and Kissinger, Kissinger's telling her where he's coming from, where the United States is coming He says, I'm an American first, I'm a secretary of state second, and I'm a Jew third, right? And then she turns around. And, you know, she understood this because she was an American, you know? I mean, she, just like him, he was started off in, in Europe, Germany, and then America, and, and then, and she, Milwaukee and Colorado, said she said to him, but in Israel, we read from, I think, right to left. So that was a really interesting scene. I mean, <laughs> she, she was so steely. The woman was brilliant. I mean, she was, you know, and I'm into astrology. She was a Taurian, a typical Taurian, a lot, a lot sensitive, but really strong. She's like, well, it, it, like in, in England, you had that iron. She, she was the iron lady of Israel. You know, she's absolutely, she, she was no pushover, you know, and, and, if if she was in Israel today, the prime minister, Israel would be in a better shape than it is now. Well, you know? that's true. <laughs> we have to talk about that. We have to talk about leadership here. Yeah. But I'd like to say that if Tony Blinken were there, his comment would be the same. Yeah, you know, he, he's, uh, what, uh, an American first, secretary of state, and he's Jewish third. Same thing. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, it, there are so many lessons here. And, um, you know, you, you, you mentioned that she was the steely lady. What made it all the more remarkable is that she was undergoing cancer treatment throughout this critical, stressful yeah. time. Right. She was getting radiation on a regular basis. It seemed like it was every couple of days during the crisis. Yep, yep. yep. Was, uh, under the machine getting radiation. And um, it, she was very weak, but she was a... a picture of discipline and will and it it it, it defines her um she was smart she was cagey she was educated and it was kind of tricky you know on the one hand you serve borscht and chicken soup and on the other hand you tell these men what for um and what kind of a fantastic leader is that this is a story of a woman who was the only woman in the room with all her retinue and all her commanders and the, the army, there was no other woman in the room, and it's just her telling him what to do. So I I, I thought that was uh, uh, an amazing statement about her and about Israel and about them. They listened to her. Oh, but uh, Moshe Dayan, I told you when we first spoke about this, it really touched me. Moshe Dayan screwed up. He he was um, the, advocating for a, uh, a, a mil militarization, a mobilization of either zero or very small, based on the intelligence they had the day before. And um, they negotiated, and she resolved, she mediated the negotiation, right? And he, he wanted zero mobilization, and the other guy wanted 200,000 mobilization, when in, in fact, um, the Egyptians and the Syrians had, were already with huge mobilization, seven to one. Uh, you know, the ratio was. And so she had these two people at the table arguing, and um, she negotiated 120,000. She, she, she made a mediator's ruling. We're going to do 120,000. Don't argue with me. That's what we're going to do. Well, actually, it wasn't enough. And their intelligence was faulty because, you know, these guys were ready to really let them have it. So mm, what I thought was very interesting is that Moshe Dayan was ready to hang it up when he saw the mistake he made. He was ready to resign, retire, whatnot. And he was, uh, you know, humiliated and embarrassed and very, very unhappy about it. And she put her arm around his shoulder and she said, Moshe, we need you. You have to continue to sit at this table. You have to continue to be, um, you know, in charge. 
Although there was one interesting scene where she said to one of his lieutenants, she said, uh, from he, see, Moshe was talking about using an atomic bomb. That's how desperate and unhappy he was. And she said to the lieutenant, she said, look, Moshe is a little um, stressed out, so don't take any orders from him. Exactly. You're, you're secretly in charge of this. <laughs> One of the other things that was interesting, you know, she was the only woman in the room, and she said to her aide, she said, uh, you know, in the olden days when, when Ben-Gurion, the, all these generals would stand when when Gurion raised entered the room, and she they won't stand for me. So that's <laughs> a male kind of thing, you know. That, but but um, th I thought that was interesting too. There were a lot of little ex uh, scenes like that that I felt were really profound, interesting, you know, like like on this in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Very and we were watching history, history being revisited, and Helen Mirren has the the gravitas to give you historical statements. And there are so many times in that movie where, you know, the, the voices were so serious and the and the, the events that were taking place were so critical, so turning point uh, inflections of history right there in front of you. I mean, I felt that it was uh, you know, an accurate statement of what happened, but more than that, it was a completely engaging statement of what happened. And, and we have to mention, of course, don't we, George, that she was later investigated. Yes. In 19, 1974, the Israeli government, very democratic, right, um, uh, uh, appointed a commission to look into what happened because they suspected that um, um, that the government, her government, was unprepared for this attack and uh, hadn't uh, mobilized quickly enough and uh, hadn't ob obtained the, the right uh, intelligence. And in fact, it hadn't. There was a mistake. In intelligence, I don't know if you caught that. Oh yeah, yeah. Definitely. So um, there she is, all by herself, smoking. She chain smoked this woman, even when she was under the radiation. She chain smoked every day, every minute. There's always a cigarette. She would do that trick where you you light one cigarette with the other, so you're always chain smoking. <clears throat> and she was chain smoking in front of this panel of uh, of, of investigators probably half a dozen of them, and she had to tell them the story about all this. And and the final comment that she made uh, off the record in that panel, you know, they said to her, how many people, how many Israelis died? And she said, well, let me look at my little books. She, she kept the record, okay, of everybody who was died, prisoner, and, and who was tortured and all that. She had she had it all. And she said, I I, I feel responsible for this. I will carry it to my grave. And then she, she turns around to the court reporter and she says, don't, don't put that on the record. Don't put that on. But they exonerated her. And, uh, and that was appropriate. So what do you think about this movie as a movie? All in all, I like the movie. The smoking, I think, was too much. Too much smoke. And a lot of the reviewers said the same thing. I mean, you know, I'm really anti-tobacco. You know, I'm wondering, was that an ad for the tobacco industry or what? But it was too much smoke. And and except that other comment I made about, you know, Golda having charisma that didn't really come through. All in all, from a from a historical standpoint, I thought this was really good. And and given the current situation, I think that it was it was really apropos for the current events to, to see how she handled this and, and how, you know, she, she was just a brilliant uh, strategist. You know, she knew, I mean, she, at times she thought it was, all, everything was lost, but she stuck it out. And given the fact that she was dying of cancer, can you imagine what kind of a personality, steely personality she had to be able to save her nation while she was dying of cancer? A phenomenal, phenomenal human being. And uh, I don't think any the Israel's had a lot of pretty good prime ministers, but I think she was she. I mean, sixty seven war. I I don't think the sixty seven war was it was it as critical for Israel as the seventy three Yom Kippur war. But this was a this was a turning point, and and she carried it out. And hopefully, the current there'll be. I mean, Anthony Blink Blinken's really trying not this thing to to get at a hand where all these other players come in and play where it could just 
you know, escalate. And so this is a very good movie. Uh, you want me to rate it? Or not yet? No, not yet. Not yet. Um, so what did you think of the acting by the principals? Uh, what did you think of the production values? Um, what did you think of... Uh, and I agree with you about the smoking. There was too much stress on the smoking. I mean, it, 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 it invited your attention over and over again, and it really... It might have been true, but we don't need to know. We don't need to see so much smoking. And I would say that they were very careful about giving you a lot of detail. And I don't remember uh, why the birds were so important. Did you notice in the final moments of the movie? Yeah, they what, were, what, even, what was that about? Even before there were things with the birds, I think the birds that the birds could sense that there was war in the air. You know, birds are they they feel things, right? And I think that they 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 felt that even, even earlier in the movie they showed and initially they showed the birds when when this battle was going to start. So I guess they sensed it. So um, I think that was the whole bir birds. Yeah, and, and then she said to the commission, she said, I felt it in my bones. Yeah. I, I should have done more. I, I felt they were going they were going to attack us on yeah. Yom Kippur. And um, yeah, so the bird, and then she would look at the sky and see the birds flying. Yeah. And that was part of her intuition, uh, what the birds were feeling, she was feeling. Yeah, you're right. Now, and anyway, acting, acting, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jay. Like you mentioned, yes. the acting, Helen Mirren was good. Uh, Liev Schreiber as Kissinger, really good. The guy that played Moshe Dayan, it could have been better. You know, I mean, just it's just, I, I sort of, it, for me, it was, it was missing something. Mm -hmm. And then you had all the other players, you know, um, the, the key actors for me and, and the key, perf the primo performances were Helen Mirren and Liev Schreiber. And also, what was her name? Katan, Claudia? What's her name? Camille. Camille Cot yeah, Cot she Cotin. Coton. She, she played um, uh, Golda's uh, assistant. Assistant. Yeah. She's a French actress. She was pretty good, too. You know, she played this thing pretty good also. Um, but some of the other acting could have been better. I mean, it just sort of left. It wasn't really up to primo. And uh, the scenes... You know, I mean, they did show maps of what was going on, and, and also a lot of the reviewers felt there really wasn't that much showing the battles, you know. But that was sort of secondary, I mean, because the, the focus of this movie had to do with Golda Meir and how she handled it and her persona, her personality, and they did good with that, right? So, I mean, I don't really agree with the reviewers that they had to have so many battle scenes. And a lot of these reviewers, whenever they have something like this, a documentary kind of thing, it's, this was not really a documentary. It was, it was a biography. It was a, a, a showcase of who was Golda Meir, and they did really good with that. So that's about all I have to say with that. And, and then the, 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 the inside of the war room, and you know, it, it, from, from that era, I mean, the furniture and everything was from, from the 70s, you know, and the clothing and stuff. So that was pretty good. So you chime in, Jay. How did you think about that? You know, give your two cents. You, you. Um, I, you made me think of her legs. She had really, you know, swollen legs. She was she was an elderly person. She's and and uh, she made a crack about. Uh, they said, "How are you feeling today?" And uh, she said, "Well." Uh, you would know if you had my legs. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Moshe Dayan, the, 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 in the movie, someone said, said in the reviewers that it was, she said that to Kissinger, but no, she said it to Moshe Dayan. In truth, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 and you know, she did, she, she had those special shoes because of her feet, you know? Yeah. I mean, someone in her 70s, like, you know, like we are, you know? I mean, what a, what a powerful person. I mean, you know, I mean, Amazing, just an amazing personality. That that's all I could say. And Helen Mirren did a. You know, what? I had the same thought that you did somewhere in the middle, where you see all the, the war stuff, and you hear the sounds of the audio feed coming from the tanks and the troops, and you heard the screams of the dying men. That was extraordinary. 
I can't imagine the frustration of the people in the war room. They're listening to this. It's happening, I don't know, 100 miles away or more. Right. Um, and there's nothing they can do but listen to their own brethren dying. Um, and so I suppose, and I thought to myself, just as you did, I thought, well, you know, if there could be more battle scenes, but I, somehow that would have corrupted the movie. Because what you were saying is true. This was a story about how, how Golda operated, how she navigated such difficult terrain, how she worked with the, all these people, how she brought it together. And it goes to the question of the lessons in leadership. She was a leader. She understood the people around her. She understood how to bring them together. She understood the challenge of dealing with the United States and with Henry Kissinger and, and Nixon and all that. Um, and that was a, sort of an example of leadership. Uh, so I, you know, I felt that um, it was okay. It, we just we know going in that this is a story about how she uh, averted a crisis, how she saved the state of Israel in 1973, and she was the one most responsible uh, for that outcome. The rest of them were following her. Um, so I didn't miss the war scenes. In fact. I was I was torn listening to those poor guys at the front who were getting killed um, on the radio, and the, all the generals are standing around listening, and Golda, you know, is beside herself because she's on the feed. She's got a headset on, and she's listening. So very powerful stuff and very informative. Um, and I think, um, you know, I learned a lot about Israel and about leadership and about uh, the relationship of, of the two countries, and, and about the, um, um, you know, the Russians and how awful they are, and Assad in Syria and how awful. He would pull the finger, remember this? He would pull the fingernails out of the Israeli soldiers, all of whom are 18, 19 years old. He would pull the fingernails out to torture them. Uh, really gross. The only foreign leader that came out well was... Uh, was uh, I saw um, uh, the Egyptian. Um, anyway, so let's talk about rating with all of that. Um, what What do you think? Because I like the whole idea of the movie and what I will give it a 9.5. Uh, but that smoking bothered me, really. I mean, I was thinking 9, but I'll give it a 9.5 because of all the other factors that are pretty good, you know, as I said, acting by Helen Mirren and Leif Schreiber and superb, right? And But I'll give it a 9.5. I got some issues, some of the other actors as well, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Give it a 9.5. Um, yeah, the smoking didn't bother me that much. What they were trying to do was give you an intimate portrait of her, and it was really intimate. I mean, I, I don't know how they did this, but they had shots of her face right down to her eyeballs. They had shots of her skin. And it spoke of um, the makeup that was involved here. You couldn't tell that it was Helen Mirren. She was made up to a fairly well. Um, and yet, when the camera got really close to her, you couldn't tell. You, you know, it looked to me like real skin. So I think there was a certain level of outstandingness on how they made her up to look like, uh, you know, Golda. Um, and, you know, throughout the movie, I was, I was waiting for a time when I would be able to recognize Helen Mirren as Helen Mirren, and it, it never came. Uh, it was an intimate portrait of, of Golda, right down to the pores on her face and her hands and her legs. <laughs> it was... So I think I, I forgive the of the, uh, the the smoking because of the excellence of the makeup because that was really outstanding. This movie is not going to get you know Oscars and awards though, and I'm not sure I understand why not. It got it got three stars from Rotten Tomatoes, which made me feel that Rotten Tomatoes should get three stars too um, for for a low rating. It was that was way low. And I feel that, um, you know, it could be that we had um, progressive liberals uh, at Rotten Tomatoes that didn't like the idea of supporting Israel. And so uh, this, they made their rating, you know, 
after October 7th, so they decided to give them a, a low a low rating. Um, Jay, Jay, one thing. If you look at some of the individual things that rated it number one, a lot of them were Arabs. Did they really storm that and, you know, and, and gave really poor reviews? And some of the reviewers also gave poor reviews. But the public, a lot of them, they just, there were a lot of those number only ones was Arabs or people of Arabic background. So that that's a factor, you know? Sure. I totally agree. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that because that's what I came away with here. And this is this is a politically charged movie. It is a statement about Israel. Um, and, and it is a statement about these Arabs attacking Israel on the holiest day of the year and doing very bloodthirsty things in 73. And and uh, the, the you know the ultimate message is Israel suffers the risk of this kind of attack every day, yes. and it has had like five wars where somebody else has attacked it, or a number of Arab countries have attacked it in a coordinated effort all the time. Right. That and that's the statement, and that's the truth. And if they want to deny that, they're denying history. Anyway, for all those reasons, I would give it a ten. <laughs> um, I was I was not only entertained, but I was historically entertained, and I learned a lot. After all, we're here to learn from the movies, aren't we? Yes, definitely. Okay, see you in a few weeks, Jay. I'll, yeah. We'll find another one. Thank you, George. George Kaysen, movie reviewer par excellence. Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.